Hi, I'm Dr. Justin Estery, and this is week 10 of PolySci 506, Bayesian Nonparametric and Computational Statistics. And uh, this week, we're going to talk about uh, the problem of missing data. Uh, it's a very common problem that uh, if you've done some research, you've probably already encountered in your, uh, in your applied data sets. Uh, and um, so it's, this is a topic that's almost surely going to come up um, in your day-to-day -day, uh, life as a, as a statistician or researcher. Um, fortunately, uh, and unlike uh, past years, we now have uh, much more sophisticated ways of dealing with uh, missing data problems than we did before. And uh, these uh, statistical methodologies can help um, uh, alleviate some of the problems uh, that exist uh, when your data is uh, partially missing. Uh, but before we get to those solutions, I just want to start off talking about um, what missing data is and, and why we would be concerned about it. So, uh, as I said uh, before, it's extremely common um, for observations uh, to be uh, partly or completely missing uh, for, for data sets that we care about. Um, and this is particularly true of uh, observational data sets uh, that are, um, in other words, data that aren't uh, coming out of an experiment, but uh, rather are um, coming out of the field. So, for example, most international relations data sets, IR data sets, um, don't happen, don't come from a laboratory. They come from uh, the world. They come from st statistics agencies in various countries. They come from... Um, uh, human rights or groups or other NGOs that are uh, collecting information about countries of interest. Uh, and as a consequence of this sort of real-world nature of the data, it's very common for there to be uh, uh, problems with that data set. So um, here's a little fake data set that I made up with the observations in the columns here and the variables in the rows. Uh, and it's really, you know, quite, quite often you'll find, for example, that some observations have uh, variables that are present for some, or uh, observations that are present for some variables, uh, but not others. So for observation two, I know y and I know z, but I don't know x. Uh, maybe I know that uh, y, the, probably the dependent variable, you know, since y is usually shorthand for that, but I don't know um, some of the uh, predicted variable, or the predictive variables, the independent variables. Maybe I don't know the dv, but I do know the independent variables. And then finally, you know, maybe I don't know anything. I'm missing all the values for the case. All of these patterns are patterns that you'll you'll come you'll see in, in real data. Um, and you know, the question becomes, what do I do about that? Well, and why do I even have to worry about it? Um, well, it turns out that first of all, as you probably already know, if data are partially missing, um, you can't estimate a model on them without doing something about it. So, for example, if I was trying to go in to try to run a regression of, you know, y uh, is a linear function of, you know, x and z um, on this data set, I would have one observation because I only have one complete observation data set. I can't fit coefficients um, to x and z for the cases for which I don't have uh, both x and z observed or if I don't have y observed. So, in other words, I would have to just get rid of all four of these observations here, two, three, four, and five, if I was going to try to estimate a model on them. Um, that's kind of uh, discouraging, throwing out data, because it makes, well, for a lot of reasons, um, it certainly it's going to make your n smaller. It's going to make your standard errors bigger. Um, and, you know, conceptually, missing data is partially missing often, but it still contains some information. So, for example, observation two, sure, I don't know what x is, but I do know what y is, and I do know what z is, and so there's still information that maybe I could extract out of that observation that's, that's kind of important. And um, if, if I just try to estimate a model on something um, with partially missing data, I'm going to lose that information. Uh, because I, I, I cannot, as, I, as we said, I can't estimate a model on, on data that's partially missing. Simply removing those missing cases, as, as we you know, often do, um, at the very least, it's going to make n smaller and standard deviations uh, bigger. That's the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, it can actually cause a bias in estimates. If, for example, the data are systematically missing in some way, uh, the missingness can create uh, an effect, a selection bias effect, a selection bias problem in the worst case scenario. So uh, we don't necessarily just want to ignore uh, the missingness. We want to do something about it. 
um, we don't want to throw out this data set, we want to fix it, we want to make it better. So uh, if we have no choice uh, but to use a data set that has missing variables in it, um, how do we do that in a way that minimizes the threats to inference that uh, inferences that we draw from those those data sets? Now, you know, one um, way of dealing with missing data is you know don't collect missing data. You know, make sure you get it all. That's fine, particularly in an experimental um, uh, scenario, and and that's uh, definitely a goal to strive for. But if we are forced to use uh, missing data sets, which we very often are, uh, what do we do in that case? Well, that's the subject of today's lecture. So let's find out. So uh, one important fact about missing data is that uh, not all uh, missing data is created equal. Uh, there are different uh, kinds of missing data that have uh, different consequences for inference. And uh, there are three basic uh, patterns of missingness that uh, I think um, that most people uh, talk about and that I want to focus on uh, today. Uh, the first is uh, data that is missing completely at random, or MCAR. Uh, data that's missing completely at random is, in short, uh, data where the occurrence of the missingness, which is to say the fact that the data is missing or not, is, as you would think, completely random. Uh, it's not related first to the value of the variable that's missing, uh, secondly to the value of other variables in the data set, and thirdly, it's not related to uh, the pattern of missingness in other variables. Now, all three of those things are equally necessary and equally important. Um, it's important that, in short, the data not be related to, um, there not be any kind of selection effect where big or small values tend to be omitted. Uh, there, it, doesn't, it needs not to be the case that, for example, when uh, some other variable is high, we're more likely to not observe another variable. And as you might expect, uh, or, or I should say one other thing, it, it can't be the case that when one variable is present uh, or absent, other variables are also likely to be absent. Uh, and as you might guess, uh, this pattern of, of missingness is, uh, let's say, uh, hopeful, to say the least, because all three of these assumptions are, are a little bit ridiculous in the sense that we, we, they're probably not true in cases where we actually see missing data. It's not the case, for example, that data are, are just dropped ran at random from a data set. They're probably missing for a reason. Uh, one very trivial idea here is this pattern of missingness in other variables. Um, if data, for example, are missing because there were no resources to collect them, or if a regime is trying to hide some of its statistics or something, it's very likely that they're just not going to report any of them. Um, it's not the case that some things will be there and some things will be gone. It'll be the case that they'll all be gone, or, or um, at least more of them will be gone. So, you know, if, if this has to do something with uh, resource availability or uh, mistakes, um, it's very likely that. Uh, data that are, are, are missing are going to be missing together, and that's a very common, you know, missing data generation procedure. Um, th these ideas, th this other idea that uh, missingness is not related to the, the, the value of the absent variable or other variables uh, in the data set is also kind of unlikely. Uh, because um, if data are, if missingness is a process, which is, if missingness is deliberate um, or at least systematic, um, for some reason, uh, then it's not likely uh, that, it, that, that the uh, system would produce a random outputs. Just as a trivial example, again, you know, for, we would, we would uh, probably expect authoritarian or maybe uh, communist regimes um, to mess with their, uh, their reported statistics a little bit to make the regime look better. Uh, or if, if making it look better is not possible, simply to not report those statistics at all um, so that the regime doesn't look bad. Um, we might, for example, see human rights data that are missing from authoritarian regimes because these regimes abuse human rights sometimes and they don't want that fact to get out. Um, they don't want it to end up in, in, in news reports or in data sets. So MCAR is, uh, I would say, a, a dream more than an actual data generation process. Um, but MCAR data uh, is helpful to think about because um, we may be able to translate other more realistic forms of missingness into data that look like MCAR. And what I mean by that is consider this example of missing at random data. Uh, data that are missing at random um, are systematic in missingness, but that 
system can be modeled. We could say this is uh, something like uh, modelable missingness. So for example, um, to, to go back to the previous example of, you know, sometimes authoritarian regimes may, may want to um, hide their human rights records or economic performance or something. Um, we might, for example, expect the missingness to be related first to the value of the missing variable. You know, human rights abuses are going to get hidden, not good records. Um, and secondly, we may be able to expect it to be related to uh, the type of regime, democracy or autocracy, or maybe the degree of authoritarianism, or maybe the degree of press openness. Who knows? There's going to be all kinds of things that we might expect to be related to the missingness. Um, that's actually, that's certainly not NCAR, um, but uh, it's a systematic process, right? It's not random, but we can model um, the missingness. We can say, well, um, the missing values are uh, random, once we've controlled for the effect of regime type and human rights violation level and all these other things. It's modelable missingness. And missing at random data is much more, um, much more realistic, much more hopeful. Um, and uh, we make it look like MCAR data by modeling out the systematic process. We effectively say there's some error in missingness and there's some signal, signal and noise, and we're going to model out the signal so that all that's left is noise. Um, so it's it's uh, contingent or conditional, um, uh, conditional, conditionally MCAR. <laughs> that's actually kind of I've never heard that said before, but uh, that's that's kind of a little turn of phrase there. This is you know sort of like conditionally MCAR is what we're shooting for in this missing at random data. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, missing not at random. Uh, this is kind of uh, uh, a long you know name for sad face data because what this means is. We've got data where the missingness is systematic in ways that we don't know or in ways that are related to uh, covariate factors that we can't measure. So this is a case where effectively there is systematic missingness and we don't know why or we could not possibly hope to model why. Uh, and as you might expect, uh, MNAR, sometimes, uh, it's sometimes written NMAR, um, not missing at random, which actually kind of makes more syntactic sense, but whatever. Um, this is the this is a case where we're going to have the biggest problems uh, with missingness. Each form of missingness has uh, different potential consequences. Generally speaking, um, MCAR data, uh, if you ignore it or simply drop the the missing cases, uh, this is primarily an efficiency issue. And what I mean by that is. Um, just simply dropping the uh, the cases, deleting the ones that have missing variables in them, uh, probably is not going to bias. In fact, there are proofs that under most conditions it will not bias your uh, your results. Uh, but it could certainly cause greater variability in what those results are, both in the estimated standard errors and also in a in a repeated sampling sense in the overall size of the uh, of the distribution. You're going to just get more variable results from sample to sample if your data are MCAR. If your data are uh, missing at random and you don't model it, so in other words, if you uh, unmodeled, and you try to simply drop the data, uh, del use deletion, delete all the cases that, are, that have missing variables in them, uh, you could get uh, both bias and efficiency problems. Uh, the scope of those problems will vary from case to case, but both bias and efficiency problems are, are conceivable. And the reason is uh, pretty simple. Uh, you've got systematic omission of cases uh, from your data set. This is akin to a sample selection bias problem, um, as studied by you know, many, many people over the years, but probably most famously Heckman. Um, it, you've got a sample selection uh, problem where your data are not being observed in ways that is related to the DGP, and uh, that systematic uh, sample selection problem is going to cause bias in your estimates with the size and direction of the bias basically depending on what the sample selection process looks like. Uh, on the other hand, if we, mo if we can, whoops, if we can model uh, the uh, um, uh, MAR process, uh, we can actually uh, eliminate um, the problem altogether. Uh, and that actually also applies to um, MCAR data as well. If we can model the completely at random missingness, um, which is actually really easy if it's truly missing at random, you can just model it as a totally random process. Uh, we have ways of, uh, of basically making these, of fixing these problems or redu at least reducing them. So uh, we, we might have some uh, maybe uh, 
uh, less of an efficiency problem. And we can eliminate the bias problem. So in other words, if data are MCAR or MAR and you don't do anything about it, you're going to have some, some difficulties. Uh, but we can also implement a model for the missingness uh, or for the value of the missing variable or both um, that are going to enable us to uh, fix uh, the problem and to eliminate uh, the bias problem and reduce the efficiency problem. Uh, now, uh, as you saw from the sad face up here, uh, this doesn't really work. Uh, yeah, so we can fix MCAR and data, to, uh, MCAR and MAR data. That should be MAR data. Uh, to look like non-missing data by filling in values based on what we do know, reducing bi uh, bias and efficiency. So this is good. Um, on the other hand, for NMAR or MNAR, depending on how you write it, data, um, sad face. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and uh, there's going to be a bias uh, problem and an efficiency problem, uh, uh, just like uh, with the MAR data. The difference between MAR and NMAR data is basically whether we can do something about it whether we can implement some kind of model, at least in theory, uh, to, fix the, to fix the problem. So if you have NMAR data, you're, you're hosed. Uh, if you have MAR data um, uh, and you do something about it, we can make the situation better. If you have MCAR data and you don't do anything about it, eh, it's not terrible, but not great. But you could also do something about it to reduce the efficiency problem. So uh, as you sort of probably guessed from, from the way these things are, are pointed out, you know, a sad face is not a modelable process. So I'm pretty much going to focus on uh, MCAR and MAR data, trying to model that, ways we can try to model that to reduce the bias and efficiency problems. So let's, let's talk about ways we could do that. So, uh, of course, missing data is not a, not a new problem. It's existed as practically as long as there's been data. Uh, but the multiple imputation methods uh, that we're going to sort of form the, the core of our discussion today uh, are kind of uh, uh, new. And so um, it's worth asking what people did in the past um, and, and you know, whether we expect those things that they did in the past to have been any good. Um, I think the number one thing that most, do, uh, most people do when they have missing data and... and uh, I've certainly done it in the past, is to just take the data set and say, if any, observa any observation has any missing variable in it, drop the case. Just completely remove it from the data set. This is, I, I dare say, the most naive, common naive method. Not the most, well, maybe the most naive method, but certainly most common naive method for handling missing data. And in, it's implemented by default in Stata in R. Uh, for most uh, packages in R at least. Uh, for example, if you run LM, uh, linear model on data, it'll simply drop via listwise deletion in any cases. Stata does it uh, as well. Uh, and it, in fact, it usually does so silently. It simply does it, and then at most, it's going to put a little note at the bottom saying, so many observations are dropped due to missing this. R will do that. Stata won't even do that. It'll just report an N uh, that's smaller than the N uh, that you gave it. Uh, this quite obviously uh, yields or leads to the maximum loss of information because uh, even if I know the value of every variable except one um, in, the, in the data, if I try to use that missing variable in a model, Stata and R will simply drop that entire case. I mean, you can imagine a hypothetical situation where I'm modeling Y with X, Z, and W, and, you know, I know... Uh, y and I know x and I know z but I don't know w, there's a lot of information in that case. Stata will just drop it. The same way it's going to treat that case the same way it would treat a case with four missing observations where we truly just don't know anything. Um, you know, I could add an infinite number of cases that look like that to the data set. It wouldn't help. Um, that's These two cases are different from one another and Stata and R, uh, if you don't ask it to do anything else, we'll treat it the same. And that's that's problematic. Uh, treating data this way is going to lead, uh, in the MCAR case, this is going to lead to the maximum consequences. You've got some kind of efficiency problem. Uh, in the MAR uh, case, um, you're going to have a possible bias problem and certainly an efficiency problem as well if you simply use this wise deletion. So the main point of today's lecture is to give us some uh, alternatives to just this wise deletion, which is probably what we're going to do anyway. Now, one step above listwise deletion is uh, to try to, to, to um, replace missing values with, with, with something that we think is a good guess. That's what imputation fundamentally is. 
And uh, what some people did to handle the missing data problem is a uh, simple uh, mean imputation. Um, now, a, a mean imputation is, is something like, okay, uh, I've got missing, uh, going back to my example up here, I've got a missing value for W, right, in this case. I'm going to get rid of, well, I'll just leave this in. So uh, I've got a missing value for W in this case. Now, suppose I've got lots of other cases. You know, there's many, many other cases in this data set. And the mean uh, for a variable W is you know, 8.5. That's the mean value for W. Well, maybe what I'll do is I'll just take this mean value right here, and I'll just plug that in, 8.5. I'm going to pretend as though the observed value for that case uh, for W is 8.5. And I'll do that everywhere. There's a missing, uh, a missing value. Um, that's uh, probably the, the second most uh, common naive method for dealing with uh, missing data. Just fill in the holes with, with pretty uninformative but not crazy estimates uh, for the missing values the means. Um, now, that actually will help a bit um, in terms of uh, uh, the efficiency problem, but the problem is you're going to go from probably having estimates which are too variable to having estimates that are falsely too narrow. So what you're probably going to end up doing in this case is underestimating uh, the SEs. Um, because when you put in uh, the mean um, for a variable for its missing value, you pretend as though you know for certain that the missing value is equal to that mean. Well, in point of fact, you don't know that. In fact, you probably know that it's not the mean, but it's a good guess. There's some uncertainty around it. It's better than no guess at all. Um, but you're not accounting for your uncertainty in that imputation. So, in short, if you were to really add in the a right amount of uncertainty in the imputation that you really had, the estimates of beta that came out of your regressions uh, using this missing, this imputed data uh, would be, the standard errors would be bigger. So um, this is not, again, not a crazy method, um, but, but uh, could, we could do better. Uh, another problem is that it really doesn't make much of an attempt to recover associations between the variables. So if I just plug in the mean uh, for, for every missing value, say for example, I've got a couple of cases, let me scroll down here a bit, I've got a couple of cases like this. I've got, you know, y, x, and z, and I've got, you know, 9, missing, 8, and I've got 6, 4, whoops, 4, and then missing. Now, if I just know that, okay, the mean of x is 3 and the mean of uh, z is 5, I'm just going to plug in 3 and 5 right there and be done with it. But, you know, probably x and z are correlated, at least a little bit. Uh, for example, maybe uh, if we did an analysis, we'd see that in the rest of the data set, the correlation between x and z is 0.6. That's useful information. What that tells us is that when z is big, x will tend to be big, and when z is small, x will tend to be small. And likewise, when x is small, z will tend to be small, and when x is big, z will tend to be big. So we could do better in our guess than just throw it in the mean. We could maybe try to get an association between these variables using our correlation coefficients, something like that. And uh, this is why I also uh, added, uh, as a variant of this particular method, uh, trying to draw out of the multivariate distribution of the, of the variables. What I mean by this is we say, okay, they've got all the variables, y, x, z, all, everything else in the data set. These things have some kind of distribution. Like I could plot, you know, here's x and here's z. I could probably try to figure out, okay, these things are distributed like this, right? And I could, I could come up with summary statistics for them. You know, I could come up, maybe I could say these are normal and these have means and standard deviations and so on. Uh, this is going to allow me to do a little bit better by saying, okay, well, if I know x is here, then I can guess that z is probably going to be somewhere in here as opposed to the grand mean. If x is out here, I probably know that x is a bit bigger, right? So if I use this sort of multivariate distribution of the data, I can maybe get a little bit better guess. That's good. That's good news. Um, so there is a variant of this procedure that maybe gets me a limited uh, attempt to recover associations between the, these variables. That's fine. 
but we could probably do even better yet. And that's when I get to this regression-based imputation. This is uh, implemented in the impute command in Stata, which is rather old now. I, I, I'm not sure it's actually formally deprecated, but it's, it's certainly, uh, it's, it's, there are better ways to proceed at this point, I believe. Um, and, and what a regression-based imputation uh, does is say, well, rather than guessing um, strictly based on, um, on the means or maybe on some kind of multivariate distribution based on the rows, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, uh, if I need to know a missing, if I need to predict a missing value for x, I'm going to say, well, x is a function of everything else in this model. Um, so we're going to call all the other variables, you know, capital W, and I'm going to estimate a regression on these with coefficients a, and uh, uh, x. My x, my prediction for x is going to be a function of that regression or that that model I've run. So I'm literally going to say x is like you know alpha zero plus alpha one um, w plus alpha two z, and I'm even going to include the dependent variable y. That's the dv in this case. You can even put the dependent variable in, and that that is not problematic. In fact, it, it makes things better. One should um, do this because we're not. This is not a causal model in any respect. We're simply trying to get the best guess for x. Period. So you you uh, uh, so prediction is all that matters, and if putting a dv on the right hand side includes prediction, so be it. So uh, you, you uh, run this uh, regression model like so. You estimate coefficients, alpha hats, and then you uh, generate your x hats by uh, using right there. You plug, your, uh, you plug the, all the other variables uh, into the model and produce predictions just like always, and that becomes your filled-in uh, filled variable. Now, um, just like with the mean estimates, we're not really incorporating uncertainty very well because, as we probably know, as you probably know, uh, these alpha hat estimates are variable. So we have uncertainty in the alpha hats that should be incorporated into uncertainty in your later model of y. So you know, if I'm running a model of y is uh, beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus beta 2 w plus beta 3 z, like that, and I'm plugging in some values for x, so if I'm taking these values for x, these x hats, and I'm plugging them in over here, my uncertainty in how I got those x hats should filter into uncertainty in beta. Um, and a, a, a naive just running a regression, predicting x, and then plugging that back into the data set wherever there are missing x's, that understates my uncertainty about the x's I plugged in. So just like with the naive mean estimate, um, you're, you're, you're probably going to um, have some efficiency problems in here. And uh, in fact, the SEs uh, have a likelihood of being too small. And by SEs, I mean the SEs of your, your final model estimates, your SEs of betas, of your beta hats, rather. So if I'm trying to model x using, or I'm trying to model y using x, if I impute x uh, with my independent variables, but I don't incorporate the uncertainty into my imputations in the final model, my estimates for beta, beta 0, beta 1x, my betas are going to be too certain, too confident. Uh, so you know, these are all these all make sense. They're all you know perfectly reasonable things to do. But um, I think it's safe to say that, that we could do better. They're suboptimal. Uh, in, in panel data, there are lots of crazy things people do. Well, not crazy. I shouldn't say crazy. There are lots of things people do um, on a sort of ad hoc basis to try to uh, fix missing data. Um, for example, uh, I've seen people do something like, well, if a value is missing at time t, so let me give it some extra room here. If I've got you know x at time 0, and x at time 1, and x at time 2, and x at time 3. Um, and these are all numbers, of course. If I uh, don't know uh, if one of these is missing, so like if this one is missing, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll just fill in the average and put that in, impute that there. So like this is a linear interpolation between uh, x1 and x3. Um, or I've seen some people do this. Well, let's just take this value and er, plug it in right there. Uh, there is uh, some evidence that's noted in various uh, outside references that this technique uh, can make your, um, your estimates, uh, your final estimates uh, using this x variable, can make them too confident um, and it can bias them. 
uh, it can also not bias them. Um, but uh, wh whether it whether it biases them or not is at least uh, hard to hard to assess a priori. So, you know, again, might make it better, might make it worse. It depends. Um, but we can certainly do better. Uh, and I should say this uh, way of thinking would only possibly work in time series or panel data where you have multiple repeated observations. So we don't even have a hope of using it in, in cross-sectional data sets. All right, so, so now I've sort of laid out some things uh, I don't want to say not to do because um, they'll all make things relatively better. And, and really, the regression-based imputation is not that bad. I, I've used it in the past um, for, for various reasons. Um, but there's probably a, a bit better way to do it. And so now I want to talk about what are those, what are those better ways to do it. So let's, let's take a look. So uh, you may have noticed the common theme in, in what was um, wrong with some of the more naive methods of, of imputation, like regression imputation or, or putting in the means, uh, is that uh, there's no um, attempt in those methods to account for the fact that our choices for imputation are, are uncertain. Uh, and so um, one of the goals of multiple imputation, uh, which is the method we're going to talk about right now, is that it uh, is able to account for the fact that our, our choices for imputation are uncertain. Uh, and, and this is, in concept, a relatively easy thing to describe. Uh, all you do, quote unquote, is, uh, is the following. Uh, use some kind of model, um, like maybe a regression model, uh, to predict the missing observations using the observations that are not missing. So um, we, we have some information, some partial information. Uh, we fill in um, what we don't know using what we do know. Uh, but instead of just doing that one time, uh, we do it a lot of times. Uh, and we do it a lot of times um, using uh, variations um, on the uh, prediction, on the, on the model that we use to predict the missing values. Uh, for example, we've got, uh, if we use um, some kind of prediction model that involves regression, so we've got you know, our, 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 uh, the model we're actually interested in is, you know, y is a function of x and z, but we've got some missing values on x. So we specify, okay, I need a, an imputation model um, that uh, makes x a function of a constant, the other independent variables, and even the dependent variable. Um, there's a VCV matrix of these estimated coefficients in the imputation model. That VCV matrix incorporates and measures our uncertainty and the extent to which we can use Z and Y to uh, plug in um, uh, values of X. So maybe what we'll do is, for example, uh, pick a whole bunch of different values out of that distribution uh, using its asymptotic distribution, like maybe the multivariate normal. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, beta hat and sigma hat from this imputation model uh, as the estimates of the mean and uh, standard deviation, uh, or variance, I guess, of that uh, distribution of, of x, of the, of the imputed x. So I take m draws out of the imputation model's VCV matrix. Now, I've called this alpha up here, so you know, I can change this to like, I've got alpha, uh, I want to draw m many uh, uh, copies of alpha out of its uh, asymptotic distribution, which is in this case is the normal for regression. Uh, so now I've got m many copies of alpha. Now I can predict m many values of the missing variable. So actually I should, yeah, here we go. If we take m many values of the missing variable using those m copies of alpha, so now I have m data sets, each one corresponding to a different draw from the imputation model. So I, I basically am not sure what to plug in for x, so I just do it a lot of times, m many times. Um, and produce m many different data sets. So now what I do is I calculate, and actually, the more I look at this, I really should differentiate between beta and alpha. Uh, so alpha, we're going to call um, that the parameters of the distribution model. Um, so I'm going to actually 
fill in uh, up here some of these uh, uh, entries for alpha so that we can be sure we're actually talking about the imputation model. So those are estimates for the uh, imputation model. Now I've got my main model of y. So I'm predicting y using beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus beta 2 z. But I imputed some values for z, or for x rather, from the imputation model a0 plus a1x, or I'm sorry, a1z, z, plus a2y. That was my imputation model that I used to plug in some stuff there. Uh, I drew m many copies of my fitted alpha values from the asymptotic distribution of alpha. So I have now m many copies of, of, the, of the data. That gives me m many beta estimates when I plug in those m many data sets back into my original model. So I've got m estimates, m many estimates of beta. I've got one for each one of my data sets. Then what I want to do is calculate the final estimate of beta. Uh, I want to, in other words, combine all these data sets I've got, all the different betas that come out of those data sets, into one final estimate of beta. And it turns out that that's relatively easy to do. All you need to do is just take the uh, mean of the m many estimates, that's your estimate of beta, and uh, the variance of, of, uh, of your estimate of beta is just a function of the within um, data set variance of beta, S squared. This right here is just going to be the OLS estimate of the normal sigma squared. So just average all the different sigma squared estimates um, for all your different um, imputed data sets to get the W part. And then B is the between data set um, variance. So this is the variance that accrues uh, due to uncertainty variance, due to uncertainty in imputation, whoops, imputation of X. And your final variance in beta is a combination of W and B. It's W plus 1 plus 1 over M quantity times B. So this factor right here corresponds to the inflation in the standard errors, oops, inflation in the standard errors of beta hat that we do to correct for imputation. So in other words, that component of our final beta hat estimates, um, standard error, that component of it is the additional noise that we introduce by trying to plug in estimates for x. Uh, and there's a reason why the formula is not simply the sum of them or the average of them, but that particular weighted sum. Uh, Rubin originally developed that formula, and it's sort of passed into um, accepted, um, the canon of accepted results at this point. So I'm not going to bother proving why that's the case, but just assert that this is a formula that's known, and that is the proper formula for the variance of beta after imputation. Uh, this is all actually fairly straightforward to explain, you know, draw a bunch of different copies of, of X, um, run your final regression using all those imputed copies, and then calculate the variance using your little formula here. That's fairly easy to do, fairly easy to explain. And it's actually really easy to do um, because there are so many packages in both Stata and R that are designed to actually do all this for you. Um, it, in fact, generates the data sets um, using model, uh, the impu imputation data sets using models that you specify. It'll run all the final models on all those data sets, and then it'll pool the results for you. 
um, so that you're you just get a little table of beta hats that looks exactly like you get uh, out of a regular linear model. Um, so let's. Uh, but actually, before we get to the software, I should say that. Um, this generic overview of multiple imputation uh, describes more or less what every package will do, but there are many, many details of how you know uh, low-level uh, things are handled that uh, are different. And there's uh, considerable debate and discussion and new research on the exact best way to implement this generic procedure. So I'm going to talk about some of the different ways that these um, that this procedure is implemented. And some you know advantages and disadvantages of both uh, are, are, of of these ways, uh, and then uh, get to uh, showing you how to actually use the software. So there are two major approaches, uh, large scale approaches to multiple imputation that I'm going to talk about in this video, and one of them is multiple imputation uh, through chained equations, uh, or mice. The MICE algorithm uh, was developed by Steph Van Buren in, in, in a variety of papers. There's even a book by Van Buren on this, uh, on this um, topic and uh, has had, there have been multiple collaborators along the, along the way. Uh, MICE is uh, uh, nice <laughs> because it's uh, fairly simple to uh, explain and it works. So what, is, uh, what does MICE do? Well, first, uh, you start with a data set that has some missing observations and you just toss out everything um, where there's no information. So in other words, if I've got a, a data set with you know, Y and X and Z and W and Q, if I don't have data on any of these variables, I can't do anything. So I just have to throw out those cases. Now, uh, this kind of makes sense because if I didn't have to throw out those cases, uh, I, that would mean or imply that I could put in an infinite number of empty cases and somehow generate information out of them, which would um, that would be quite a discovery if you if one could do it. But I, but I have my doubts <laughs> as to whether that's that's feasible. So you have to just get rid of observations that contain no information. Then uh, for whatever you have left, which should be most of the data set, uh, just start off by filling in a random uh, random numbers. Um, for the missing observations. So for example, if I've uh, got a, a, a line of this data, observation one here, and I know it's two, three, and then there's a blank, and then eight, and then four, um, I'm just gonna start off by putting in some random number here, two. Now, um, it, it may not be a completely random number. For example, I might start off by filling in all the means. Uh, I might start, in by, start off by filling in a draw from the distribution of z uh, the univariate distribution of z. So I know it's got a mean of four and a standard deviation of one. Maybe I just draw from that and, and put it in. So in other words, my, my guess is not stupid. I'm not guessing a million. Um, but fundamentally, this is going to be a fairly naive uh, guess. This is not the final guess. This is just a quasi-random guess, just, just to start off with. Uh, then what you do is the following. So I'm going to create a fake data set here. Um, blank, one, eight, blank, six, Four two three blank one one four eight two seven. Let's say that one has no missing values. So I've, I filled in uh, missing uh, missing. I filled in all the missing um, values here using random numbers. Step three says what I want to do is I want to start with a column and I'm going to move through this column. For example, the first column is Y. I'm going to pick any observations that are missing, such as this one, all right, and I'm going to impute the missing value using everything else. So I'm going to create a model for the missing values of y using x, z, w, and q. I'm going to come up with a prediction and I'm going to use that to update my prediction here. So I'm going to come up with some new guess that's going to be better. Now you'll notice all of the random things I entered in here are going into this imputation model. So they might not be very good. Maybe they're great. We don't know yet. Uh, but they should be better at least than the random guess we made at the beginning, or the quasi-random guess we made at the beginning. So maybe, you know, this changes to three. All right, fine. So I fill in anything that's missing here, and then I move on to the next column. Well, there's no missing values for x, so I'm safe. Then I move on to the next column. Ah, we've got a missing value right here for z, okay? So now I say, okay, here's a missing value, uh, an imputation model for x using uh, y, uh, I'm sorry, for Z, using Y, X, uh, 
w and q, okay? y, x, w, and q. So now I'm going to run that model, predict a value for z, and plug that in right there. And this model uses my new value, my, whoops, uses my new value for 3 here, that goes in, that I previously imputed, plus these two old values for w, they go in here too. So already we've gotten a little bit better. Our estimate for z is going to be a little bit better because we're using this imputed value for y here, not just the random one. Now I think you can guess where this is going. Now we move to the next column of w, we build an imputation model uh, using y, x, z, and q. We impute, using this model, these two missing values. And, you know, let's say our previous guess up here for z was like, you know, 1.8. Um, these two values, 1.8 and 3, these are now in the imputation model for w. So our imputation for model w is, uh, our imputation model for w is incorporating information from our previous imputations for y and z. So we're going to get, you know, hopefully better guesses, you know, like maybe 7 and 2 here, for the missing values for w. Then you just repeat that process over and over again. You repeat, you repeat, you repeat, you repeat, you repeat. You could have a fixed number of repetitions, do it 20 times. You could maybe have some kind of convergence criterion, if you like, where the, where the imputations stop moving around. Whatever. The idea here, hopefully, is that by doing this over and over again, each time you repeat the cycle, the imputations all get better because they're all sort of iteratively improving on one another. Uh, at a certain point, you're going to just say, we're done. I'm done doing this imputation. Uh, and so, bam, I create a data set out of that. Then I start over and I repeat the process over again. And you do this whole process m many times to create m many imputed data sets. Now, there are two sources of variability in this imputation process. Um, one of them is your random seeds that you start at the beginning might sort of lead you in a certain direction in terms of the final uh, destination of the, the final values you arrive at for imputation. Another source of, uh, of variability is, you know, if, you're, if your prediction model, if your imputation model is like regression, um, and you're not just picking the, 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 the maximum likelihood prediction, you're choosing out of the distribution of, of all the possible predictions, uh, then you've got variation in the, you've got uh, variability um, that accrues due to the uncertainty in the imputation model. So your data sets, you've done this m times, they shouldn't all look like each other. They won't look like each other. They won't look like each other because, you know, your seeds are a little different. You start your starting uh, values for, for all the missing values, but also because there's uncertainty in your imputation model and the, uh, the mice process when it fills in the values is incorporating that uncertainty. Now, I mentioned that uh, you're not always just picking the, the, the you know, one value for imputation. There are actually lots of different ways to impute variables using the MICE algorithm. Uh, and the differences are all pretty much, uh, I should put in the thing here. The differences are all pretty much uh, in um, step three and four. What method do you use to do the imputation and how do you choose the estimate, the imputed estimate from that method? So one way of doing it is good old regression. Run, a, just like I mentioned up here, you run, you know, models for each uh, missing, or each variable with missing observations and you run a model on it and then generate predictions out of it. Regression is an obvious way to do that. It could be logistic regression if W is binary, for example, or multinomial regression if W is categorical. Uh, or linear if w is continuous, or Poisson if w is a count, the missing variables account. Uh, that's that's fine, makes sense, and uh, and um, you can either pick the uh, y hat, the maximum likelihood y hat that comes out of that, or you can say well there's a distribution of of y's uh, of predicted. So in this case the w is the thing I'm imputing. So there's a distribution of w hats that come out of this, and I'm just gonna pick one according to the, you know, the, the most likely ones get picked the most and the least likely ones get picked less, but there's still some variability in that. So, you know, either I pick just the maximum likelihood W hat or I pick out of the distribution of W hat. So I could either pick W hat or the distribu or, you know, choose out of the distribution of W hat, sample out of that.
The default actually is is not uh, regression for for mice, at least as implemented in the mice package in R. The default is something called uh, predictive mean matching. Uh, predictive mean matching um, is the default in mice for continuous variables, and and what it involves is. Uh, Calculating the predicted value for a missing variable from the regression model, and then choosing the three cases, and you can actually change whether it's three or five or two or whatever. Pick the uh, pick some number of cases. The default is three that have the closest predicted value in terms of Euclidean distance, and then randomly choose one of those three values to impute. So, uh, for example, if I've got a little data set down here, a fake data set. Suppose I've got, you know, uh, y, x. Z, W. And I've got some numbers here, 4, 2, 1, 8, 6, blank, 3, 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 9, 4, 1, 3, 2, 8, 9, 6, something like that. Okay. I impute uh, using a model of Y, I'm sorry, X on Y, Z, and W. I create a predicted x hat. And my x hat for this observation where it's missing is, let's say, 2. Okay, So mm, I plug a 2 in there. Well, mm, not quite. What I do is I say, all right, my x hat for this complete case would be 1. For this case, it would be 1.6. For this case, it would be 8. And for this case, it would be 6. So what predictive mean matching does is it says, OK, the three closest x hats to my imputation value here are 1, 1.6, and 8. That corresponds to observed x's of 2, 4, and, whoops, 8's not the closest, 6 is the closest. But, no. <laughs> Hold on, sorry. 6, here we go. So 2, 4, and 8, okay? I randomly, I roll a three-sided dice. Three-sided dice didn't exist, but suppose it did. I roll a three-sided dice. One of those numbers comes up. I plug that number in. So suppose I come up with this one here. I plug in, uh, actually that one's too, it looks too much like this. Suppose that it's, I pick this case right here. What I do is I plug in four, the value for that case. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, I'm going to use real data to fill in real data, but I'm going to use my imputation model to pick which one I fill in. That's the, that's the general idea. So um, pick the three cases that have the closest predicted values and then choose the one that makes the most sense. So this is a way of kind of hopefully uh, uh, not relying so much on the, on the quality of the imputation model. The imputation model gives you candidate cases, but the actual data come from the data set itself. I, I have to say there are many different ways of doing this. I've only very briefly hit on two. Um, each of these two ways, um, there are m numerous sort of um, elaborations, uh, differentiations that are possible on these, two on these two methods, and there are other methods besides. Um, and both of these two uh, sort of tweaks are inside of the larger approach of MICE, multiple imputation using chained equations, which is itself not the only approach. So by no means am I telling you the right way to do it. I'm just giving you a way. And, and this is a way that in Monte Carlo studies has, has shown to be pretty, pretty good, pretty reliable, at least when data are MAR. Um, but it's not the only way. Uh, and, and it's not the only way, uh, uh, the, the, another way that's popular is of particular interest uh, to, to, to um, uh, scholars using Bayesian modeling. And so I want um, to talk a little bit about Bayesian data, augmenta Bayesian data augmentation as an alternative to, the, uh, to mice um, that might make a lot of sense if you're already uh, using a tool like WinBugs or JEGS to, to run your model. So let's, let's talk about Bayesian data augmentation. So the idea um, of Bayesian data augmentation uh, stems from the insight that uh, multiple imputations such as those implemented in the MICE algorithm are a form of, of Markov chain. Uh, you start with a particular um, value uh, and you um, update um, your value for, uh, you start with a bunch of values for, for all the different um, imputations uh, you're going to make 
and then you update each imputation based on the state of the rest of the uh, imputed values. So as we saw in the previous uh, uh, note, uh, notepad, your imputation for a variable w um, includes imputations for x and z and y and all the other variables um, that are being used to generate the imputation model for w. So if I've got uh, variables w, x, you know, z, and y, and I'm going to um, uh, update my imputations multiple times. Um, I, if I, when, I, when I start off, uh, um, really there needs to be a zero here, but let's say these are the initial, these are the initial values that I've plugged in randomly um, for each one of these uh, uh, variables. When I go to um, create my uh, first real imputation for W, I'm going to use all of these values that I originally put in to generate that value. And then when I uh, go to uh, impl uh, impute x here, I'm going to use this and, uh, and also these. This is exactly the way a, a Markov chain um, gets updated uh, using a Gibbs sampler. You know, use um, all the previous uh, states of the uh, Gibbs uh, of the Markov chain um, plus any updates you've already made this particular iteration to um, create the new link in the chain for whatever variable that you're currently interested in. Well, if you accept the idea that, that uh, this imputation process can be thought of as a Markov chain, well, we are already uh, building Markov chains um, as a part of Bayesian estimates. Uh, we use Markov chains to draw samples from the posterior in order to derive some inferences about that posterior. So why don't we build a missing data model uh, right into the uh, Bayesian model that we're already estimating. In effect, just treating the missing uh, observations as another parameter. So instead of f of beta being a function of the data, uh, now f of beta and the missing values is a function of the data that we can actually observe. And you know that, just like uh, everything else, uh, is proportional to the distribution of the uh, observed data contingent on beta and the missing values and some prior about uh, beta and the missing values. Um, there's a proportional relationship between those two equations according to Bayes' rule. So um, all we're going to end up doing with this augmentation process is uh, sampling not only beta but also the missing values out of the posterior uh, using Mar Markov chain Monte Carlo and then to come to some inference about beta, we're just going to uh, integrate out the missing values. Um, and we're going to integrate out the missing values, or the integrate out the distribution of the missing values, rather, by summing over them the way we would sum over any other in uh, incidental parameter that we weren't interested in. So, for example, uh, our Markov chain at the end of this is going to have a bunch of draws for a missing value and a bunch of draws uh, for, for beta. You can think of this Markov chain as just being a really long list of values that we've sampled out of. Now, we don't really care about the, uh, about the combined relationship between uh, these two things. We don't really care about this, in other, or yeah, we don't really care about uh, this, in other words. All we care about is this. So um, that's easy to do. For example, if we wanted to know the, the, uh, the mean of, of beta, uh, we would just take the mean of all these observations and that would give us the uh, mean of beta uh, integrating out y miss. If we wanted to know what's the density uh, uh, of beta at some particular value, beta, you know, zero, um, what we would do is just take, okay, where are all the observations uh, where beta equals beta zero and what's that fraction of the total? Uh, now, we might have multiple values of y miss at these different observations, but we don't care. We're just summing over them to integrate out of them. In essence, what we're doing is we're just ignoring the information about y miss and drawing inferences about beta. This is, like I said, the exact same thing uh, we always do in a Markov chain. When, for example, we want to get the marginal density of one beta estimate, so we all, very often we have like a beta 0 and a beta 1 and a beta 2, and we don't necessarily care about the f of beta 0 and beta 1 and beta 2 together, and we don't even really care necessarily about the conditional estimate of beta 0 given beta 1 and beta 2. 
We just want to know what's f of beta 0. And the way we would do that is just to look at the samples of beta 0 and you know, come to some, you know, create a kernel density estimate or take the mean or whatever it is we're interested in and ignore the samples of beta 1 and beta 2. Just concentrate on the samples of beta 0. That integrates out beta 1 and beta 2 in creating that, um, that density. The same thing happens in the, in, the missing, uh, in the case of missing data. We just impute it. Those are parameters we've estimated, and then we ignore them. We just don't, we don't care about them. As long as the data are really missing at random, uh, and there's no, uh, and the fact of missingness, in other words, the um, occurrence or absence of the data itself is not related to beta, which is sometimes called the ignorability assumption, although ignorability, I, my experience has been there are multiple definitions in the literature which aren't all the same, but whatever. Um, the Van Buren book calls that the ignorability assumption. Uh, then, uh, then, or is it the Van Buren book? No, somewhere I read. This works fine. Um, in other words, if we don't have to, um, if we don't have to uh, account for the pattern of missingness, this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. If we need to account for the pattern of missingness as well as the particular values uh, of of uh, the missing variables, then we need to create a missingness model as well as a why miss model. So a binary variable, say r, equals 0 if the variable is not missing and 1 if it is. You model that, and then you model f of y miss given r. So if, y is, if r is missing, or if r is 1, what is the value of y? That's a so-called missingness model. And if we could model that missingness explicitly if we didn't have this ignorability condition that held, um, but if it does hold, we don't need to bother with that. We can just impute y miss uh, directly using some kind of regression model. Now, I, I think that the best way to understand these, these various procedures is to actually see them implemented in, in R or its data, see the actual nitty-gritty of what they're doing, and look at some results. Um, that's, the, I, in my opinion, the best way to understand them. So let's just, let's, we've got a, a theoretical background and some basic description of what's going on in this process. Now let's see it in action. All right, so I've opened R. This is the lecture 10 file for today. And I'm going to use the uh, MICE library, which uh, implements the multiple imputation using chained equations approach that we discussed in the lecture. And what I'm going to do is start off with a really basic uh, MCAR regression model. Uh, and what I'm going to do is, is build a, a data generating process using the full data set. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, suppose I can't actually see what the full data set is. 10% uh, of each variable is missing. So what I've done is just basically drawn a miss variable, and I'm going to replace x, y, and z with uh, an na value if those things are missing. So my final x, y, and z variables have missing data in them. This is the, the dat data frame here. So if I look at what dat looks like, here's x, z, and y, I've got some missing values, like so. Now these missing values are missing completely at random. How do I know that? Well, here's where the missingness was induced. It's missing completely at random. I'm just literally flipping a coin that comes up 1 90% of the time and 0 the other 10% of the time. And if it comes up to 0, I drop the case. So this is a very uh, mild uh, form of missingness. It's a missing completely at random case. The uh, MICE package allows me to create uh, data sets. And uh, these multiple imputation data sets. And so the mice command is what does it. And I can just call up the help here so you get a sense of what the um, particular um, uh, syntax of this package looks like. Uh, the three basic things you need are a data frame that has some missing values, the number of imputation data sets you wish to create. Five is often uh, uh, the, the arrived at as the minimum number that you need. Uh, one of the surprising uh, findings of, of Rubin's research is that you actually don't need to impute very many data sets in order to get a proper estimate of, the, uh, of, uh, of beta given the missing data. Five is often considered uh, sufficient. With excess computing power, you can do better by estimating more. Um, I'm going to stick with five, but if we you know, were really serious about this, maybe we would want to use 10 or 20. Uh, and then the max it function tells uh, mice to repeat the multiple imputation process, the cycle in other words, 20 times for each variable. Uh, so um, we're going to go through a cycle of an imputation 20 times before we say we're done and we're going to create a data set. We're going to 
to spit out that multiple imputation data set. So in essence, max it times m is the total number of times we're going to have to run through this, uh, this MICE algorithm. Uh, fortunately, this happens pretty fast on a reasonably modern computer. So it's already done. And now mi.dat is a collection of five multiple imputation data sets. We can visually assess how well we're doing using some various tools. The, the BW plot tool um, creates box and whisker plots of the distribution of each variable in the original data set and in the multiple imputed imputation data sets. So the blue is the original data set and the pink are each of the imputation data sets. And ideally these should look pretty similar and in fact they do. The uh, multiple imputation data sets for X, Z, and Y all pretty much look the same as the original data set. Note we are imputing the dependent variable, which is going to be y, along with the independent variables x and z. That is uh, an acceptable practice and, 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 and not only acceptable but recommended. It will, it will improve performance and it won't overstate um, the certainty in estimates because like uh, we already noted, there's um, uh, the uncertainty in our imputations is actually built into the process. So we're going to incorporate that uncertainty into our final um, estimates of, say, the relationship between x and y. Uh, a density plot just gets into, it's the same basic idea as the BAM or the box and whisker plot, uh, but using kernel density estimates instead of uh, simple box and whisker plots. So we've created kernel density estimates for the original data set, which is this uh, solid blue line, and then for each of the imputation data sets, which is the red line, and the kernel densities are estimated for all the variables that have been imputed, which in this case is x, z, and y. And uh, what you can see here is, uh, you know, these things should look the same, and they pretty much do. Um, the densities of the original data set look pretty much like the densities of the imputation data set. Nothing too crazy uh, seems to be going on. Uh, the x, y plot um, is pretty straightforwardly a way of just excuse me sorry it's, it's pretty much a straightforward way of um, uh, listing uh, the original observations in the data set and the filled in observations so zero is the original data set which consists of only non-missing observations um, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are the five imp multiple imputed data sets that I created, and the red dots are the filled-in dots. In other words, they're the imputed observations for each case. And what we'd be looking for in this plot is some evidence that all the imputed data look really different and are not in the, in the sort of set of the um, originally imputed, um, or the original observations. We'd also maybe be looking for some kind of systematic uh, pro pro process, like for example, all the imputed data, all the imputed values for x are all big. Um, they're all you know close to one or close to 0.5 or close to zero, something like that. All small, all, all medium sized. In this case, what you can see is that the data, the imputed data look like they're pretty spread out across the space, which is what we'd like if the data are truly missing completely at random. And the imputation procedure is sort of what we would expect to see from, well, particularly from NCAR data, which this is. Uh, now, uh, what we want to do is take this imputation data set, uh, this Im imputed data set, and, and fit a model. And uh, the with command um, allows us to uh, implement a model with the multiply imputed data sets. So what it does is it recognizes that we've got five different data sets, and we want to run this linear model on each one, and then we want to combine the results in some way. So the fit object is where these results are being stored. You can see there are five different um, five different models corresponding to the five different imputation data sets. The pool command allows us to lump all the ver uh, all the results together in a way that's consistent with Rubin's combination formula, and then we can summarize those results to get a nice regression table showing us what we've got. So these are the um, results that come out of our multiply imputed data sets. The est is the estimated beta coefficients between uh, x and y, z and y, and the intercept. And what we should be getting, um, based on our, uh, our DGP, is uh, ones for x and z and a zero for the intercept. And we're not too far off of getting that. And here are the t-statistics for each of these. They're all highly statistically significant. That's a little bit disappointing in the case, I'm sorry, the uh, intercept is not uh, statistically significant, which is what 
we would expect to see. Sorry, I've got the yawns this evening. Anyway, um, the uh, that that's all uh, that's all sort of well within what we would like to see. And what we might want to do is compare these multiple imputation data set results with the naive results of listwise deletion. So here's where I run the model on the original data set with listwise deletion. Here's where I run it with the uh, imputed data, uh, the imputed data. And uh, what we can see here is that the uh, z coefficient gets closer to what we would expect it to be. Um, in other words, it goes from 0.6 in the naive uh, listwise deletion case to 0.7, which is closer to the true value of 1. Uh, the intercept goes from 0.2, um, which is further away from its target for 0, down to 0.11. Down, in other words, it also gets closer to its true value. And it goes from being marginally statistically significant to very firmly statistically insignificant. So, in other words, in MCAR data, missing imputation works. It makes our results closer to what we would expect uh, given the DGP. And which makes sense um, because, you know, the MCAR condition is met just like it's the most favorable condition for imputation. Uh, now, uh, I have to say that if we did this many, many times, we would expect that the naive results would be clustered around, they'd be centered on the true values, but their distribution of those results would be wider than the results that we would get out of uh, multiple imputation because MCAR data is inefficient but not biased. That wouldn't necessarily be the case in MAR data where a failure to, to model um, would actually be uh, more consequential and could cause bias. In other words, the naive estimates might not well, may, may well not be centered on the, on the true values, whereas we would expect the imputed values to be, to be unbiased to, to work. All right, so now I'm going to repeat this process, uh, same as before, same model and everything, but I'm going to... Um, include more missingness. So here, I had a 90% chance of retaining the sample. Uh, down here, I'm only going to have a 50% chance of retaining the observation of the sample. So if I bind all these together, the data set should be of size 200. But if I actually do a naive regression, I'm going to have 182 observations deleted due to missingness. Because each one has a 50, each, each variable has a 50% chance of being dropped, which means that at least one of them is gone for most of this data set. So this is a rather severe missing data problem and three quarters of your data set's missing. So we would expect uh, mice maybe not to do so well on this case because you're really trying to extract a lot of information from, from very little uh, data. Well, but let's, let's see what happens. Um, let's see if we, how well we can do. So I bind all this data uh, together uh, into a data frame uh, and I create my five uh, multiple imputation data sets and you know, there's a little more going on here. So maybe I'll up this to like uh, 40 iterations and I'll do uh, 10 data sets just to get a variable, a better sense of the variability. So if I uh, get mice going here, it does this really, really quickly. Now, one of the reasons while this is running to talk about, the one of the reasons that uh, it was so important to keep M down to like five or six is because when these uh, uh, models were, when these ideas were first developed in the 1980s, it could take a long time to create these multiple imputation data sets and it could be you know, quite annoying to do so. But now uh, with modern computing, as you can see, I'm cranking out 10 data sets um, with 40 iterations each in, in absolutely no time. It's already done. Um, so there's no reason, especially in a sort of final published uh, analysis, to, to do a little bit more imputation uh, as long as you've got a reasonably uh, new computer. So uh, my bandwidth plot, or I'm sorry, my box, I keep wanting to say bandwidth. My box and whisker plots, yeah, they look fine. Uh, if I do um, XY plots, now you can see I'm plugging in lots of observations because I've got 50% missingness. But fortunately, uh, they look pretty much like the, um, the original data set. Uh, that's good news. Um, incidentally, I'm leaving out Y here, but I could easily um, show Y in my XY plot as well. Yeah, looks fine. Um, my, my variables all pretty much uh, look the same way the original data set looks. So my imputations aren't doing anything nuts. And there are no systematic patterns in the imputation, such as all the observations being crowded at one end or the other. So I'm reasonably certain that my imputation model is doing its job. So now if I fit my model uh, with imputation and then uh, create a summary, wow, results are actually pretty good. X is pretty close to one, Z is pretty close to one. They're both statistically significant and the intercept is statistically insignificant. So, you know, pretty close to zero. Uh, if I do my naive regression, um, 
Actually, no, pretty good. We're getting a, we're lucking out in this case in the sense that the uh, naive regression is is with list wise deletion rather is actually pretty close to the right answer. Um, my x uh, actually overshoots. Uh, it goes from being about 1.4 away to being 0.33 away. So it actually gets a little worse in this case. Uh, my z overshoots as well, and my intercept gets closer to where it should be. So um, again, not surprising, uh, given that MCAR data is uh, it's less efficient when you estimate it with list-wise deletion, but um, we can do better, in, uh, but it's unbiased, rather. And uh, MCAR um, data is, um, when you use a, a, a model like MISON, is you're primarily fixing uh, efficiency issues. Um, so, you know, doesn't, it makes sense that MICE doesn't do quite as well with this radical degree of missingness um, as it did before, but it doesn't do terribly. Uh, and it's, it's, on average, probably still going to be better than, um, excuse me, still be a little bit better than, um, or actually quite a bit better in many instances than um, uh, just a little spice deletion. Uh, now let's talk about a case where we have interaction, uh, uh, interaction variables. So I'm creating a data set here uh, where uh, y is a function of x and z and also x times z. So in other words, the marginal effect of x on y depends on the value of z, and the marginal, marginal effect of z on y depends on the value of x. So I've got a, a case of interaction. Uh, but there's 10% missingness in x and, and, and z and in y. Um, now, you may have noticed that xz is a variable that comes out of x and z. It's not its own xz variable. So when we go to impute xz, it may not be the best idea to try to model it as a function of y and x and z using predictive mean matching or regression or whatever it is that we could go, along, go on with. Rather, it would be better to impute x, impute z, and then multiply the imputed value of x times z to get xz, rather than to try to impute it. Uh, this makes a, more sense because, for example, if you try to directly impute xz and xz separately, you can very easily impute a value for xz that is not equal to the imputed value of x times the imputed value of z. <laughs> In other words, if I don't know x, uh, but I do know z, obviously I don't know xz, but I'm not going to try to fill in x and xz separately. I'm going to fill in x and then multiply it by z. That's what I'm going to do. We can do this in mice pretty easily. Uh, what you want to start off doing is creating an, uh, uh, an MI object that actually doesn't have any missing data in it. So in other words, we're not going to impute. We're just initializing the MI process. So set max it to 0 and m to 1 to create what amounts to an empty MI object. So uh, an MI object, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, rather, a mice object has multiple um, uh, uh, characteristics associated with it. And one of them is meth which corresponds to the method of imputation. And if we just type in meth here, which is the uh, meth object of mi init, you can see that it's listing xz, xz, and y as having the method pmm. That corresponds to predictive mean matching, just like we talked about in the lecture. But we don't want to imp uh, impute xz via, um, uh, um, uh, via predictive mean matching. We just want to fill in uh, x and z with predictive mean matching and then multiply those two things together to get xz. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the meth of xz to be x times z. Now this twiddle here means, to tells mice, do this uh, procedure. In other words, implement uh, this formula, uh, this passive, it's called passive imputation. Uh, take already imputed objects and then do something with them to create this object. So uh, I tells it that this is an expression uh, that needs to be implemented literally, meaning it needs, it's, a, it's a series of operations which should be executed by R. Uh, and the operations we're going to execute are to take X and multiply it by Z. So now what we've done is we've changed the method to passive imputation, so-called, for XZ. We're going to just multiply the imputed value of X times the imputed value of Z to get XZ rather than directly imputing XZ. Right. Uh, the next thing we need to do is change the prediction matrix. The prediction matrix, or pred, of a, of an, of a mice object um, tells you what variables are used to impute what other variables. 
So the row variables are used to um, impute the, uh, wait a minute, let me think about this. Yeah, the row variables are used to impute the column variables. Mm, is that right? No, the row variables are imputed using the column variables. That's what I meant. So for example, right here, the first column or the first row X, to impute X, we're gonna use Z, XZ, and Y. To impute z, we're going to use x, xz, and y, and so on. Now, I actually don't want to use xz to impute x or z, <laughs> because xz comes from x and z. It doesn't predict x, x and z. So what I'm going to do is set uh, the x and z rows for the xz column equal to 0. So now X and Z do not use, you can see right here, X does not, no longer uses XZ to impute itself. It only uses Z and Y. Similarly, Z only uses X and Y to impute itself. Now we could go through the formal process of setting the Y component of XZ to zero here, but we don't really have to worry about that because we've already given it a formula, X times Z, that doesn't involve y. So having y in the prediction matrix for xz, eh, I mean, technically it's wrong or unnecessary, but it's not going to change our results at all. So now that I've done that, I actually want to impute the data sets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm actually just going to use 5 and 10 as the, as the m and max set here. And I'm going to use the meth and pred matrix, or pred values rather, um, that I just created as a part of the mice process. So I'm now telling it, use passive imputation for XZ and don't imp include XZ as a predictor of X and Z separately. How have I done? Well, my box and whisker plots all pretty much look like the, uh, look like the target data set or the original unimputed data set. My bandwidth plots look pretty reasonable. For example, this uh, skewed shape here, all the imputed data sets look skewed on XZ. That's actually good. If the XZ uh, distributions looked crazy, that would be a cause of concern. Uh, I actually want to do XZ and then XZ and then also Y for my XY plot. So I'm going to come in here and do that. They all look pretty good. One thing about I notice is that the Y values are somewhat clustered around the center. That might mean there's systematicness in the, uh, now of course I know that's not true because <laughs> I created this data, but that might ordinarily indicate some kind of systematic process in the missingness of Y that I'd at least want to think about, make sure I had modeled that correctly so that it's M M A R rather than MCAR. Uh, I'm sorry, M A R rather than NMAR. Uh, and then my XZ values, well, most of the imputed values are small. That makes some sense because XZ is a multiplicative variable. So you just have a skew, uh, there's a skewed distribution, which we saw uh, here, which means most of the values that are imputed are small, but so are most of the values. So that's not, that's not terribly concerning. So what do we get if we uh, estimate naive and imputed models uh, with our interaction term? Well, uh, all of the coefficients should be equal to 1 except the intercept, which is equal to 0. And actually, um, looks like we actually don't get terribly large differences between them. Um, the intercept's a little closer to where it should be. Uh, X and Z are actually a little further than where they should be. Um, but the standard errors are a little bit smaller, so that's good news, I suppose, for statistical significance. And uh, the XC coefficient shrinks, which is a little problematic, but the standard error also gets smaller, which is, I suppose, good. Um, so, you know, it makes sense. Um, if we did this over again um, with a different data set, we might get uh, slightly different answers. So if I don't reset the seed, but just repeat all this over again, let's see what happens. Uh, interesting. Actually, still getting a little bit further away. Huh, that's really interesting. Let's see if I do it again with yet different data. So now they're getting closer. Yeah, now they're actually getting closer to where they should be. All the coefficients are closer to 1 or 0. 
if I do this again, let's see what happens. So now they're closer to where they should be. These are a little bit too low in the uh, naive data set and the XE coefficients too high. They're all closer to where they should be. So you can see that you know, in repeated samples, we generally do better, but there are some samples where we might do a little bit worse. And if we were concerned about the performance of this, what we might do is uh, come in and um, create uh, more data sets and a larger number of um, uh, iterations per data set and see if that improves the performance of the imputation model a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and restart the original um, data set. So I'm going to reset the seed, in other words, and see if imputing, uh, doing more iterations and more imputed, Im imputed data sets actually improves performance. So let's break for a little bit while this runs. Okay, so we've let that run, and uh, the naive estimates are the same as they were before. Uh, and yeah, it looks like the... Um, Looks like the imputation corrected data sets are also pretty close to where they were. The differences are a little bit smaller, which we would ex expect. Uh, the standard errors are still smaller, which is, is good, I guess. Um, huh, that's interesting. So uh, anyway, that's how one would um, uh, do imputation on a model um, uh, that had an interaction term. Now, what if we had a binary uh, independent variable? And the same thing actually goes for a binary dependent variable. Uh, so what I've done is I've, uh, I've recapitulated this data set, but I've decided to make Z, um, instead of being continuous, Z is now binary, 1 or 0. It's a factor or variable with two levels, 0 and 1. If I uh, induce 10% missingness in this variable uh, and uh, then create a data set, you can see that just sort of uh, goes without a problem the mice package will automatically detect that this is a binary variable and will adjust its method accordingly. So if you look at the mi init um, command here that just, you know, doesn't, it just initializes mi, doesn't actually do any imputation, and look at the method that it's going to pick. For z, it is picked logreg, which is short for logistic regression. So instead of doing predictive mean matching using standard continuous regression, it's going to impute uh, impute um, Z using logistic regression, a logit model. Uh, it will automatically detect um, to, to uh, uh, that uh, the, the structure of the independent variable and adjust accordingly if the independent variable is a factor. Uh, in other words, if it's a factor type variable. If it's just a zero one number, it won't detect that. It'll decide it's continuous and use predictive mean, ma predictive mean matching. So if you're going to do this um, and you want um, mice to automatically pick up the type of your variable and adjust its imputation process accordingly, make sure that your um, dichotomous or polychotomous variables are identified explicitly as factors rather than as numeric variables. Or alternatively, you can be numeric variables, but then you'll have to manually set the method to be logreg or polyreg if you're going to use multinomial uh, modeling for uh, um, discrete multi-valued um, variables. So we can just uh, go ahead and do our usual thing here, impute the data, and run regressions with and without, uh, the, uh, with the imputation and without, and you can see, hmm, actually, not too different. Looks like the results are pretty similar in these cases, which is a little, I guess, encouraging. Uh, the intercept is uh, smaller, which is what we would expect, um, given that the true intercept over here is... Uh, where is it? Ah, here it is. The true intercept is zero. So actually, they're they're both too big. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Uh, and both statistically significant, which is not too encouraging. Uh, but the x coefficient is a little smaller, and the z coefficient is uh, a little bigger, which is both you know, positive improvements in the direction that we would like, um, given the pattern of missingness. Okay, so um, that's how you uh, impute data um, in, in, uh, in R using the MICE package to implement uh, multiple imputation using chained equations in a variety of different uh, data structures. All right, so uh, the last bit uh, for uh, today's uh, video is about Bayesian data augmentation. And uh, what I'm going to do is return to an example uh, that we talked about uh, in an earlier lecture. Um, this is data um, from a paper that uh, Gina Cirillo and I wrote on uh, the relationship between 
uh, women in government and corruption. And the basic model here, you can see in my uh, in the bugs file. Uh, if I go actually to the uh, the model without, uh, hold on a second, let me open the model without imputation. Okay, so here's the model without imputation. And what you can see is this is a pretty basic model where uh, corruption, uh, WBGI corruption, is going to be modeled uh, as a uh, combination of uh, effects from women in government, total number of women in government, and uh, polity. Um, and this uh, uh, I uh, indicates that we're actually um, imputing, um, I believe we're imputing the value of um, uh, women in government here um, using the impute command in Stata. Um, so what I'm going to do is just do a real basic model. There's a random effect on region here in addition. Um, and if uh, I run this uh, model without um, any kind of uh, imputation, uh, where do we go? Mm, one more. Uh, whoa. Oh, I've got to change the working directory to the source file location. There we go. So, uh, whoa. So now uh, Winbugs is going to estimate this model for me. And uh, it's going to produce um, some coefficients for the relationship between women in government and corruption and poly score and corruption. And in particular, what we're interested in is how the effect of women in government is different at different polity scores. So you may have noticed in this uh, bugs file that uh, this coefficient right here, uh, the total coefficient on, on women in government, is a combination of B1 and D1, where uh, B1 is the base level of uh, relationship when polity is zero. The D1 coefficient allows the uh, women in government coefficient to change uh, for different values of the polity score. And ultimately, we're going to come up with um, is this. This is a relationship for uh, different values of the polity uh, variable. In fact, I might change this up a little bit so it's, it's clear. Uh, the x-axis um, gives us uh, each polity score. And the uh, y-axis, not xlim, it should be xlabe for label. And uh, the y-axis is uh, the change in corruption uh, given a 1% increase in uh, change of women in parliament. Uh, and actually, I think I can make this... Yeah, that's fine. So um, what you can see here is that for um, uh, small values of polity score, um, there's no relationship, or at least no statistically detectable relationship, between women in government and corruption. But for democracies, there is a positive relationship where uh, more women in government means, actually it's more cleanliness. That's a cleanliness measure. So bigger values mean um, less corruption. So now what we want to do is think about maybe um, uh, doing some analysis uh, where we um, don't impute the uh, values using this um, simple impute command uh, in Stata, which is where that I comes from. And maybe we also want to uh, impute missing values for polity uh, and uh, for corruption score. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to add a multiple imputation model to this uh, particular to this to this model, and the multiple imputation model is featured up here, right there. This is the multiple imputation model right here, and what you can see I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I'm going to create a, a a matrix called Miss that consists of two vectors: the vector of women in parliament and the vector of polity score. And uh, I'm going to suppose that those variables are multivariate normal distributed with some kind of vector mean and some kind of VCV matrix um, precision. And uh, I'm going to impose pretty diffuse priors on the, uh, on the means for the, uh, for the uh, women in parliament and uh, the polity scores. And I'm also going to assume a fairly diffuse Wishart distribution for the, uh, uh, for the um, precision matrix of the relationship between these imputed variables. Now, all this, I, I mean, I could maybe just sort of junk this and leave it just like that. I'm adding in this extra stuff because I know that women in parliament and polity are bounded variables. Uh, women in parliament is bounded between 0 and 1. It can't be less than 0% or more than proportion of one or 100 percent. 
uh, the poly variable is bounded between negative 10 and 10. Now I could actually do even further and make this, you know, use the step function to make this a step variable because polity is a discrete variable with negative 10, negative 9, negative 8, and so on. There's no such thing as a 9.2 polity score. But I'm just neglecting that uh, particular complication for this model uh, and allowing it to impute partial um, or, or uh, fractional values of polity. But I do want to bound them to be between negative 10 and 10 the way the scale is designed. So I've created this max and min bunch here just to just to bound the impute, imputed variables. And, and that's all I do. I've just created a model. I basically modeled these variables as being multivariate normally distributed with some kind of common means and some kind of precision matrix. Now this corresponds to the idea of drawing the missing values from the multivariate normal distribution. So I'm allowing there to be covariance between the two missing values and I'm allowing them to have uh, uh, non-zero means. Um, so I'm capturing some degree of the extent to which uh, polity and, and women in parliament go together. But um, I'm not doing it quite as quite as uh, in quite as complicated a fashion as using a fully fledged, fleshed out regression model. Now in a bivariable case, and where you've got two missing variables, the difference between a, multi, a multivariate normal um, imputation and a full-fledged regression is going to be minor because rho is going to be analogous to beta in a two-variable regression, a, variable, a regression of women in parliament against polity, for example. So we're not going to gain a whole lot by using a, a fully-fledged uh, regression model. Uh, but we could gain some. And in fact, one thing I didn't do is uh, I didn't include the dependent variable in this imputation model. So I'm losing a little bit of information there. Now you might be asking yourself, the dependent variable has some missing values as well. Where are we imputing those? Well, it turns out that all you need to do to make um, uh, a Bayesian uh, model impute values is to make that value stochastic. So here's the dependent variable, WBGI cor uh, a corruption score. It's normally distributed with mean and, and, and uh, precision. And here's the model uh, that we originally specified right here. You can see there's got a random effect at the end there. There's the effect of polity. There's the effect of women in parliament. Uh, but I'm using the imputed scores for women in parliament and polity as opposed to the raw scores like I did before. And the dependent variable is going to be imputed automatically when it's drawn out of its distribution. So in other words, it, missing values in the dependent variable are imputed strictly by the process of estimating a Bayesian model, at least when you do it in JAGs, WinBugs, and OpenBugs. So I don't have to think about imputing the dependent variable model because that happens as part and parcel of the process. Now, one disadvantage is I'm not including the information about the dependent variable in the imputation model for polity and women in parliament. That's true. I do miss out on a little something there. But what I do, what I gain as a result of that is that uh, the imputation model is not separate from the uh, from the regression model. In fact, the information from each one can feed back on each other in in some ways, unless I specifically stop it from doing so. And so I'm estimating uh, my model really much more holistically than I would in a in a mice uh, type framework, where I impute the data sets and then kind of patch it on the back end uh, as an afterthought to the main regression process. Um, here, the modeling of the dependent variable and the imputation of missing values is one holistic giant model that I'm modeling with one posterior. So it's a much more integrative uh, process um, and it, uh, uh, it, it can, in some situations, it can actually be more accurate than a, a mice style imputation, but it's a little bit harder to program. So I'm going to repeat my uh, regression model, uh, but I'm going to use this Bayesian imputation process. And I'm going to plot on top of my original uh, plot here the uh, new results that come out of using my imputation model. So WinBugs is going to do its thing. Uh, it's estimating the imputation values and the model values at the same time transparently. And you can see it's just doing, going about its business the way it always does, uh, estimating parameters as though there's nothing different than what we did before. So when this is done, I'll show you what the results look like. All right, so the red uh, line here indicates the uh, results of the model with multiple imputation of both variables through the Bayesian modeling process, whereas the solid line 
um, is just straight Bayesian regression using um, no imputation for the poly scores and uh, only um, uh, standard um, regression imputation for the women in parliament scores that I actually did in Stata before as part of the preparation process for the Stata set. And what you can see is the estimates of the line are pretty much of the same slope. The slope doesn't change a whole lot, but there's been a shift downward. And so um, this is, a, in effect, um, uh, uh, it may not be biased in, in the sense of um, the, the, um, one of these lines is uh, closer to the real estimate than the other, but in general, we would expect the Bayesian imputation model in repeated samples uh, to have a tighter distribution around the true estimate, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the true value of the, of the parameter than we would um, either a, a completely naive listwise deletion model or even the sort of basic regression imputation model that we used that didn't account for uncertainty in the regression estimates. Uh, so, you know, maybe this model is more believable. And it, it, is tell us, it does tell a slightly different story. Uh, the, the, the story that uh, this model tells um, is that uh, polity, the polity score here, um, for the most autocratic countries, uh, more women in government leads to more corruption and less women in government leads to less corruption. But for the most democratic countries, more women in government leads to more corruption, less women in government leads to less corruption. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, it, it, it's certainly a, a somewhat different story than there being no difference in autocracies uh, for women. Uh, I'm not sure I'd have to do some more investigation to figure out whether this is uh, something I believe, although I have to say that both stories are, are not terribly inconsistent uh, in the sense that both of them uh, emphasize the fact that women are, are cleaners. Uh, they, they, they clean up corruption in democracies, but not really so much in autocracies. So they're both support, both result, both models are supportive of that basic result. Uh, but whether women actually increase corruption in autocracies, that would be a, a rather different wrinkle. And so might need to look into that a little bit more. Um, Certainly, I would want to use more uh, control variables, like like in the published version of the of the paper, before I concluded that with certainty. But you can see there's an interesting applied example of hey, using multiple imputation on a model can actually get you different results and results that are different in substantively meaningful ways. All right, so uh, that's a pretty uh, straightforward and I'm sorry, a pretty basic rather uh, surface level introduction to the topic of multiple imputation. Uh, you can go much deeper into it. Uh, there are whole books written on the subject. And this is an area of active research uh, in, 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 in methodology uh, so that many of the questions have, have not yet been answered. And so this is a, an exciting place to get involved uh, with, with new methods uh, if this is the kind of problem you're interested in. Uh, but hopefully this will uh, give you some tools uh, to use and some ideas to think about um, if you encounter missing data in your own models, which you almost certainly were. Uh, and give you something to do beyond simply saying, well, screw it, I'm going to delete the, the missing observations and pretend like nothing's wrong. Uh, it's nice to have a little more to do, that, uh, a little more to try rather than that very basic approach, and, and this should give you, help you get started on, on, that, uh, on that process. Uh, thanks a lot, and I'll see you next time.